Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Puppet Masters and Castle Freaks. Uh, it is I, the headless chalk line of one of your hosts, <laughs> Jared Hornbeck, coming to you, of course, from Brooklyn, New York. And uh, something's coming. Can you feel it? Because I can feel it. I, I feel like I have a co-host who's with me today. Oh, it's me, Steve Guntley, down here in Austin, experiencing more than the five senses, uh, which I got to <laughs> say, pretty fun so far. Uh, this is the podcast. It's all about interdimensional eels, eyeball sucking, and kinky shrinks. And that's to say, this is a podcast all about From Beyond, which is Stuart Gordon's 1986 follow-up to his smash hit debut film, Reanimator. Uh, no sophomore slump for this guy, let me tell you. Hey, go, coming in strong, coming in confident, coming in weird. I'm going to piggyback off you for a second, Steve, because I think... I speak for both of us when I say that this is a heavy hitter and a property of this magnitude. We would be doing it a disservice to talk about it with just the two of us, I think. Oh, yes. So I feel like yeah. uh, we've got someone else who is here to join us. So, Steve, tell tell our listeners who's firing up the resonator with us today. <laughs> <laughs> I am very, very excited about our guest today. You might know him as uh, one of the former head writers for the Onion AV Club. Uh, he is a an author, prolific writer of many books, including uh, You Don't Know Me, But You Don't Like Me, uh, Joy of Trash, uh, My World of Flops, Weird Al the Book, many books on Weird Al. Yeah. It's, uh, a fantastic uh, little cottage industry to be in. Uh, it's uh, Nathan hey. Rabin is here with us. Uh, so excited to have you, Nathan. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much. And actually, uh, Puppet Masters and Castle Freaks is one of my favorite David Bowie songs. Oh, yes. Uh, it's, pretty good uh, so it's very cool that you guys kind of got right. It's right before Ashes to Ashes. And whatnot. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, <laughs> it's a banger. Uh, as they say. Well, we're we're really excited to have you here. One of uh, the the recurring columns you have over on your website, uh, Nathan Rabin's Happy Place, which you can find at nathanrabin.com, uh, is uh, uh, the joy of trash, where you're basically uh, exploring all the different fun things that you can find in trashy properties. And I feel like we kind of share a mission statement here on our show. And I, I, Full Moon features are very much a conduit for joyful trash. Uh, so I, 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 I figured you would be uh, a knowledgeable person to talk about uh, these movies. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a whole world onto itself. And I, I don't know, I get like the Full Moon uh, email blast recently, uh, seeing that they had a giant trunk with like all 17 Puppet Master movies and like yes. a bunch of crap. Like, I can do <laughs> yeah, the whole brand is so strong that I'm like, Thinking about spending one hundred and seventy-five dollars on all, you know, forty-seven movies, it gets a little <laughs> bit silly. The Band Brothers, uh, they, they they got a little uh, a little goofy. Uh, they did somewhere it. along the line. I gotta say, yeah, a hundred percent. Nathan, I wanna I wanna ask you. So typically, our introductory question, because in the first few episodes of the show, Steve and I told our own personal histories with not just Full Moon or Empire properties, but with low budget cinema, horror, exploitation, and all that. And we sort of hit on what some of the formative movies for us were and what got us into this as something that stayed with us into adulthood. So I, I wanna turn that question over to you. Like, when was it that you decided in, in your young life, presumably, that trash cinema, as, it, as it's called, it would be something that you would devote so much of your life to? Was there one particular formative movie or experience? Like what made you think like, this is going to be something, this is going to be my livelihood, not just something I enjoy. Oh, totally. I actually uh, have a eureka moment uh, mm -hmm. in my uh, memoir, my first memoir, 2009's uh, The Big Whoop. Mm -hmm. uh, and I write about being 13 years old and being absolutely miserable. I was depressed. I hated myself. My parents had gotten divorced. My dad was sick. My dad was unemployed. Uh, pretty much everything was miserable at that point. And I remember one afternoon uh, wanting to go to the movie theaters. Uh, and I wanted to see Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure in particular. Uh, but I had no money to do so. So me and my sister, uh, we went and who now is a very uh, respectable and responsible human being. Uh, uh, so we went down to the uh, laundry room and there was a, a jar full of quarters that you, you know, give a penny, pay, whatever. Uh, so that if we take all of these quarters, we can use this cash money to go see Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. <laughs> so that's what we did. And I remember, you know, the, uh, the, the lights going down and the curtain spreading. 
Uh, and just being absolutely transfixed by this very silly, very ridiculous motion picture. Uh, and yeah, thinking to myself, I wanna be part of something that can bring people so much joy, that can make people who are so unhappy and so miserable and so lost, uh, this feeling of escape and this feeling of pleasure and transcendence. So Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure is the movie that changed my life and made me want to devote my life uh, to film. You know, that is a great pick. That's a great pick. I mean, <laughs> so we we both talked about how we, when we were kids, we were the types who would just kind of like idly wander around oh, video yeah. stores. Is that is that your experience? Oh, as that well? was me as well. Uh, like, yeah, a lot of my my happiest childhood memories are yeah. wandering around video stores and fantasizing about all of the weird movies that I was going to uh, be able to watch when I was old enough. And uh, yeah, I, kind of the video store was my happy place. Yeah, uh, yeah and so was, it's uh, it's been so cool hearing so many people have that same experience like for the oh. feedback we've been getting from our show it's just like i always assumed it was just kind of a me thing that i was the weird kid like wandering around looking at movies and it's like no this was this is a lot of like cool people no, have been doing this not, 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 not only that but i um i when i was 16 years old i got a job at uh, blockbuster video oh yeah uh and it seemed as, like as 16 year olds are as 16 year old, and i gotta remember uh getting paid four dollars and 25 cents an hour Oof. uh which was the minimum wage then which seemed like a, a perfectly decent amount at the time and i remember thinking like it was such an amazing job that like i think it was a group home like there must have been uh, money <laughs> put under the table to allow a schmuck like me to have an amazing job, like working in a video store. Uh, and I worked in a video store for uh, the rest of high school and then college. And that's actually how I kind of became a professional writer. Mm -hmm. but one of the dudes that I worked in a video store with uh, ended up being sort of my my mentor uh, at the AV club. And I went to horribly, horribly south. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I I can totally uh, attribute working in a video store for getting my start as a film critic. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I was very, very lucky. I felt, you know, like I must have won the cosmic lottery to be a <laughs> one year old and to be writing for the AV Club and for The Onion. And yeah, I did that for 18 years. Yeah. <laughs> 18 wow. very, very long years. Oh. Uh, so yeah, they, and, and I remember as a kid looking at, at Full Moon uh stuff and looking at the box for the reanimator and uh you know they're geniuses at branding and they're geniuses at creating this uh, aesthetic and they're geniuses at making movies about evil bongs absolutely <laughs> okay. I mean, look we we came down hard on that movie but i can't yeah. imagine anyone else making a better evil bong movie you know are, I, are, I can't are, you, are you more into evil bong versus the ginger dead man <laughs> we will we'll get there greatest, eventually greatest uh, crossover of all time it's the one that yeah. everybody was gagging for but uh I, I'm, <laughs> I'm really excited for today's episode because uh we talked about Stuart Gordon once before we talked about uh, 1989's Robot Jocks which yeah, is yeah. kind of an anomaly in his career it's a very very fun movie but it's not the usual type of thing that he does and I think today yeah. we're getting into his bread and butter which is goopy lovecraft adaptations and uh that's that's always so exciting to see like th this is just really his wheelhouse and nathan has been going through the entire Stuart gordon filmography uh for for a column and uh, i've got a column on my website for a hundred dollars initially and then 75 dollars for each additional uh film i write about a film of your choice and then mm -hmm. some people are very very kind and they have me, uh, they pay me to write about somebody's complete filmography. And because my uh, readers, God bless them, are very, very weird, it's all Freakazoid and Batman Beyond. Mm. Right, which I've never seen before. I'm like, wow, those cartoons are both amazing. Yeah. Uh, I watched all the Oliver Stone movies and realized I hate them. <laughs> I, going in. Uh, I watched all of Connie Contain and Rebecca Garrett's movies. And then, yeah, some kind, kind, kind soul. Uh, wanted me to write about all of uh, Stuart Gordon's movies. And that has been a wonderful, wonderful experience. And Robot Jocks, you're right, that's a, an interesting anomaly in part it because is. it was inspired by the Transformers. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that he's like, I want to make a Transformers movie, and he made a Transformers movie that I think is better than the actual Transformers movies. Uh, I, even I would agree. Really hot, like, hot take. No, yeah, I'm with, I'm with uh, you on that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like Bumblebee, but other than that, I like Bumblebee, yeah. Not good. Yeah. We uh, talked a lot in our transfers episode, uh, or, or no, I'm sorry, I was going to say before about the Charles Band's mark on home video and just how walking hmm. around the video store, there was so much incredible art for this product that they were making and putting out there. And so 
his influence on home video is so vast and all of those titles, there was so much to look at. But yeah, in the 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 Robot Jocks episode, I think I was mentioning that Stuart Gordon was someone who I had seen a lot of his movies at different times. I remember the VHS box set, the box art for Dolls was mm. one that actually scared me. I had a weird thing where I was totally fine watching adults murder people but if it was a child or a doll it was very freaky to me and that box art that cover art really got me but i was saying how i Stuart gordon is someone who his name it's not a household name per se but when you go back and you look at his filmography and you look at the mark that he made it's like it's not out of the realm of possibility to throw his name in the ring when you talk about auteurs oh yeah well i think he deserves the greatest uh title of all which is fright master yes uh, he is a legit fright master actually absolutely and that literally was his his strategy for so many things it's like mm. make a bunch of posters and uh, then make whatever movie sells you know and sometimes it you know you you create something completely different from what the poster says but i mean that's also yeah corman used to do the same thing and he used to give a lot of young art auteurs a real great early shot and i yeah and i do think that Stuart gordon falls in that category i wanted to give a little bit of background on Stuart gordon that we didn't really get into in the robot jocks episode mm. but i feel like it's more relevant here one of the big things that we kind of failed to mention in that first Gordon episode is that he got his start in the theater world. And oh, yeah. this is actually pretty important for a lot of different things. So back in the 60s, he was a student at the University of Wisconsin, awesome. and he gained notoriety for one show in particular, which was called Game Show. He, he did this really experimental and boundary pushing stuff. And Game Show was one of the most notorious because... For that play, he locked all the doors. Everybody who came to the audience was trapped in this theater. And he had plants in the audience uh, who were actors, but like were posing as audience members. And the cast would break the fourth wall, come down into the stage and commit these horrific acts on members of the audience. You know, they would they would beat them or they would torture them and they would rape them. And there were you know, th there were riots. There were people who were really freaked out and really upset. But it gained him a lot of notoriety. And from there, he and his wife, Carolyn Ferdy, Ferdy Gordon, who is also in this movie, they moved to Chicago where they founded the Organic Theater. And this was a hugely influential theater group. This is where David Mamet got his start. Dennis Franz, Joe Montaigne, a lot of heavy hitters came out of the Organic Theater group. Um, and so I'm, I'm bringing up the theater world because I think Gordon had kind of a theatrical approach when it came to casting his movies and his themes. He's also very, very indebted to Roger Corman, who we were mentioning. And Roger Corman had a long series of Edgar Allan Poe adaptations where he would use the same stock cast and just bring them back every time. You can kind of see Mike Flanagan doing the same thing now with like some some uh, kind of ghost story adaptations on Netflix. He had a but troop. He has a had troop. a troop. He yeah. has a troop. And, oh, yeah. uh, well, he worked with the, like, the same sort of uh, behind the scenes people in film, yeah. film as well. You know, Dennis Paoli. Uh, is all of her stuff. The Dan brothers are all of her stuff. Uh, again, I think you're right. And actually, another reason why I feel a connection with him is because I grew up in Chicago. Right. And then I went to school at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, uh, where he was a legendary figure. I remember God, there was a, a Madison Film Festival, and mm. he was there and he presented uh, Space Truckers. Oh, amazing. and I think it was in the context of, you know, I literally got more money than ever to make a movie and the studio won't fucking release it mm -hmm. um so he was pretty frustrated by that and yeah it ended up going direct to video and i, I, don't know, he, I was underwhelmed by it the first time uh and i really liked it the second time around just because it's such a weird fucking movie it's a and weirdo, it's such a yeah. it's such a Stuart Gordon movie too and the, the charles dance uh again you kind of start off as like oh this is a bad guy and by the end he's david cronenberg's worst nightmare yes uh which again is also very you know sort of akin to this like i kind of realized like Stuart gordon does body horror as well as david cronenberg does oh, and i feel like and i was beyond, lucky i can enough. make that grandiose statement because my god it is i think it's a masterpiece it's just a great great film yes 
I just want to put one thing in there. I was lucky enough to to see and touch one of the square pigs from Space Truckers <laughs> in, in person, and it was super, super cool and a weird, you know, fuzzy tactile experience. And, and uh, getting back to the theater thing, uh, that's yeah. one of many collaborations with George Went. Uh, right. Who yeah. Really they started off in in, uh, in theater uh, in Chicago together, and then he cast him overwhelmingly as just a horrible, monstrous uh, individual. He did a, a like a really nasty neo noir called um, King of Ants that was actually put up by the Asylum. Oh right, uh, yeah, and I if you saw if, that one, it looked yeah, cool. yeah. If you want to see George Mount play just the most disgusting piece of shit you'll ever see, oh, uh, if you ever talk about it, like it's like pretty much everything he's done, it's way better than it has any right to be. Hell yeah. I mean, yeah. And I, I think that does kind of sum up a lot of it because I think, you know, look, Stuart Gordon absolutely lives in the B movie zone, but he always just brought a little bit more intelligence, a little more satirical edge and just kind of a little bit more daring. Well, I'm getting back to the Corman thing. There's also an element of uh, social commentary. In yes. His stuff. And also this idea of the mom, specifically like dudes are horrible. Dudes are disgusting if given their others and they will become literal monsters from beyond yeah uh, and i just will. wrote about the last uh project that i wrote about was a uh he did an episode of the show fear itself oh it yeah the, the follow-up to uh masters of horror it's called eater and it stars elizabeth moss uh and it's really really interesting and it's really in her wheelhouse in that it's mm. about a strong plucky woman who deals with misogyny in both you know sort of an individual and then sort of an institutional level so yeah, we definitely have this idea of, of toxic masculinity and men who are monsters even before horrible, horrible things happen to them of their yeah. own doing for the most part. Absolutely. And I mean, I think that that matches very well the vibe, the Lovecraftian vibe that Stuart Gordon goes to. So lo, lo, Gordon wanted like Lovecraft to be his Poe. Like you know, Corbin has Poe, he wanted Lovecraft and he wanted to make a series of Lovecraft movies and, with the same cast. And so that's why we have three different movies with jeffrey combs and barbara crampton as the leads uh doing love Crest. we have reanimator we have from beyond and we have castle freak and gordon would also go on to direct several other adaptations without that cast but if you've seen dagon the 2001 yeah, yeah, yeah. movie that he does he casts a dead ringer for jeffrey combs in the tell, lead. I, I think i'm not in my piece i referred to him as being a younger and handsomer and less creepy <laughs> right Combs. right but he still has kind of like that twitchy like sweaty energy that jeffrey combs has and, and, and i think he was in another uh gordon movie as well so he's like, oh if yeah I, if i can't get uh jeffrey combs i can get the next best thing hey uh, nice. which is this guy who has a very heavy jeffrey combs vibe he does and, yeah and, <laughs> and he would bring jeffrey combs back again for more lovecraft for lurking fear which That's is right which is one that we will hit stay tuned listeners yeah, yeah, a, a uh, an interesting kind of companion piece to this one, where where uh, Jeffrey Combs is kind of sidelined for a lot of it, and the the Lovecraftian monsters are a little bit more conventional. But oh, I was just saying, uh, Gordon himself uh, directed two Poe adaptations: uh, mm. the Black Cat for Masters of Horror, and then the Pit. Yeah, Pit the uh, Pendulum. Will, of- will, yeah, I'm excited to get into that one. I haven't seen that one, but uh, that's a, that's a full moon feature. So we'll be we'll be hitting Pit and the Pendulum before too long. Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, this I, I went back and I read the original Lovecraft story of From Beyond because it's very, very brief. It's only about two pages long. Uh, and it's so this is an incredibly loose adaptation. <laughs> In the story, there's an unseen narrator who is just talking about his best friend, Crawford Tillingast, who's been messing with this device that is taking him to another dimension. And at the end, it's just revealed that that device was making him crazy and they find a bunch of dead girls in the house that Crawford has been slaughtering. So they take that basic framework and then they sort of blow it up here in really interesting ways. Uh, In particular, one of the themes I wanted to explore this because I'm not quite sure where this movie comes down on it, but this movie has a very heavy ink theme. And I'm not quite clear what the film's attitude towards kink is. Uh, I know that it's <laughs> in the 1980s, this idea of like a dominatrix is, it, it's a little bit different than what we think of it as now. You know, it's a little <laughs> bit more of a scary thing, more of a taboo thing. And I think it's meant to demonstrate 
decadence and corruption here. We were somehow supposed to be turned off by Debbie Harry in Videodrome. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, and, by, and Barbara by Barbara Crampton. 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 Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and so like they, there is there is kind of an interesting element where that's sort of representing what it means to go beyond your earthly delights. You know, this is something that is unnatural. This is something that is beyond the scope of earthly delights. And I, I wasn't 100 percent clear on where this movie came down on it. Well, I think, you know, as with a lot of horror movies, there's a sort of ambivalent uh, attitude to it, where on one hand, there's this uh, sick fascination, uh, this morbid uh, interest. But at the same time, you know, there's an element of uh, moralism and judgment and this idea that, you know, um, sexual transgression uh, can lead to a really, really not only a dark place, but a place so unbelievably dark that human minds can barely uh, comprehend it, which I think is the essence of Lovecraft. And I feel like Jeffrey Combs was uniquely suited to playing somebody who is so intense and so off that you can really believe that they've seen another world and they've Absolutely. been traumatized and scarred by it. And, you know, it's, and again, I think that's one of the things that's interesting about From Beyond is that it affects you on a psychological level and a mental level, but it affects you on a physical level as well. Like Jeffrey Combs ends this movie a much different person physically than he was when he started. I mean, you know, it, it's a movie about how men become monsters. And part of that is that, you know, there's a monstrousness. Uh, in them to begin with that is unleashed either by circumstances or in this case by crazy multi-dimensional machines uh, that you know bring you into contact with you know yeah he's got a smaller p uh pineal gland at the end of this movie <laughs> yeah he's a, he's a little shorter sure. he's a little shorter i would say uh, <laughs> but i mean yeah i think if this movie were to be made and i know this movie kind of was made today for a movie called banshee chapter back in 2013 that's like a remake mm -hmm. of the same story but uh i think if you were to take this Stuart gordon film and make it today i feel like uh Barbara crampton's character and her trans transmogrification into like this dominatrix would be a little bit more of a statement of power than mm -hmm. ultimately i think it i i i don't think she's playing it entirely helplessly or anything i think i think uh, well first of all i want to say barbara crampton is um, incredible in this movie i think this might yeah. be her finest performance ever i mean she is so good and she's really committed and i think she is playing the conflict here where she is she does feel empowered in this new position. I think like at one point, like uh, he actually holds her to a mirror and says, is this who you are? And she just kind of breaks down and says, I don't know. Mm. You know, I think so. She's wrestling with those elements. But I do think if this were a modern movie, we would be a little less ambiguous and it would probably be, would be, um, yeah, a little bit more pro kink, I would say, at least yeah. in terms of uh, the the understanding that we have of it now. Feel free to disagree with me about this, but I kind of call this the slumber the slumber party massacre um, theory. I guess we'll call it for this, which is Amy Holden Jones and and Rita Mae Brown were making what they felt to be a transgressive sort of parody of slasher movies, but because they were still backed by. Uh, production companies that were typically run by men they were sort of strong-armed into making it seem less subversive and more like a straightforward slasher movie when the movie was made mm -hmm. because i feel like it would have been very difficult in the early 80s to make a, a movie that empowered the female characters to the point that the screenwriter and director probably wanted and i feel like that's probably a bit in play here too i think maybe the the movie's feelings towards Hank and the way Barbara Crampton has to play it here is it can't be entirely empowering because it's 1986. Mm -hmm. I think there has to be, there is sort of that Reagan era, you know, I mean, not that this was a movie that was made in the United States, but I think it, it was made by, you know, Americans and Italians, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But it was, I, I think a lot of it has to do, it needs to be more ambiguous still because the average viewing audience in 1986 maybe wasn't ready for such a statement. 
Which is one of the things I thought was really weird is when I was reading reviews of this movie at the time, almost universally, the consensus was this is a a, a tamer and safer movie than Reanimator. And I don't know what the fuck <laughs> they were watching <laughs> where they thought this was a less weird, more restrained film than Reanimator because they go fucking hard in this movie. Well, and Reanimator too, you can say like, oh, this is Dr. Frankenstein's story. This yeah. is a variation on like one of the core stories of uh, sort of horror and science fiction. And with from being beyond you can't say that like this movie is so strange and so weird and one of the things i love about it is that it it doesn't start slow and then gear up it starts at 10 and then it goes to 11 and 12 and it stays there for 85 minutes it stays there absolutely it never gets less intense it never gets less crazy i mean you know there are moments of, of, of relative levity but again there's this overwhelming feeling of dread and horror and that these characters are doomed and the world just an awful place that is absolutely full of monsters and sort of getting back to the Corman thing I think with Gordon you know his relationship with the bands with Full Moon with Empire was he was an artist and yeah. he wanted to make a statement and his bosses wanted boobs and gore and violence and lots of people dying and to so Gordon's genius was that he was able to satisfy himself as an artist and he was able to satisfy the exploitative Schlagermeisters who yeah. wanted him to make a commercial motion picture and part of the commercial element of this is it's got really cool nasty special effects it has you know barbara crampton who is a very beautiful woman uh and various uh sexual tableaus so yeah i i think he was uh, serving two masters here absolutely uh, he it helps my job at it it helps that gordon has always been a bit of a button pusher you know and yeah. he always he always likes to kind of uh, provoke a response not for nothing you know but he just likes to he likes to mess around and see what the possibilities of the narrative uh could be you know and it's also interesting to note that like Lovecraft was, did not really have the same cachet in 1986 that he does now. Like, I think we we use the term Lovecraftian, you know, so it's kind of in the vocabulary. We understand a little bit more about who he was. He was still fairly obscure for mass audiences at this time. There had not been a lot of movie adaptations. There was like a Dunwich horror movie in the 70s, Reanimator, and then this. And I think it's just because film technology could not really keep up with this idea oh. of... A, a horror that is so bizarre and otherworldly, it will make you go crazy. That's a hard thing to depict on screen. And I really appreciate what they went for here. And I think they they kind of came closer to capturing it than any movie up to this point. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely so. Uh, and, and again, I feel like uh, it's a very, very difficult thing to try and adapt to the uh, work of H.P. Lovecraft for the silver screen because a lot of it is ideas. A lot of his ideas that are so beyond that you can't really comprehend them. That there's, yes. you know, this world beyond our world with these unfathomably complex and powerful and dark gods. And how do you represent that on screen and how do you show that? Um, and I think one of the one of the away. one of the best things to happen to H.P. Lovecraft's career is for him going into the public domain because we get to keep his imagination, which is second to none. It's really pretty incredible the things he came up with, but we also get to hand it over to artists who have a little bit more narrative structure and maybe are less pro eugenics, you know, maybe less yeah, who maybe wildly are, racist, aren't quite so racist, yeah, <laughs> who aren't quite yeah. so terrible. And it's funny because I, uh, you know, my son is eight years old. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I have to resist the urge to saying, you know, that this great artist, <laughs> like so many great artists, just hated Jews. Yeah. <laughs> like, we're all dull. Like, it's hard to not have that be part of it. That was to, a hard one to learn. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard yeah. to talk about Lovecraft without being like, he, you know, he was a, he was a dark and weird and creepy uh, human being. It, it's funny. If you look on Wikipedia, there's an image of him. Mm -hmm. and. He, he looks like the most Lovecraftian person and you know it's like yeah he just seemed haunted and, and and sad and weirded out and like thinking of something crazy and it's like you 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 look and act exactly like how you would think uh from like your he, work from your he looks like he hits the laudanum really hard yeah, yeah. 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 He's, 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 he looks he's like he's seen a ghost He's he's huffing ether from a rag, yeah. That's yeah. that's the vibe that he has. And he's yeah. a ghost and uh he will never get over it.
Yeah, but I think it's so great that like people like Stuart Gordon can take his stuff and make it. I mean, that that two page story is not even all that entertaining. It's creepy. Yeah. It's got some ideas, but like there's no story here. And here it gives it a story, kind of makes it a classic haunted house. If we're going to give a basic plot overview, basically we have uh, Dr. Pretorius, uh, played by Ted Sorrell, is kind of this mad scientist type, a real genius. He's created a device he calls the Resonator, which allows access into other dimensions that are kind of around us all the time, but are inaccessible to us. He sees too much. He loses his head when a monster comes through and rips it off and leaves his assistant, Crawford Tillingas, who's played by Jeffrey Combs, in kind of a manic state. He winds up at a mental institution where Barbara Crampton's character, uh, who's a psychologist, takes him under her care to find out what happened. They're also joined by Ken Foree playing Bubba Brownlee, who is a local police detective slash former football player. Uh, perfect casting on that, by the way. I Thong think he, enthusiast. He, he, Song enthusiast, yes, fan of tiny little little underwear. Um, and so basically they go back into the, the house at 666 Benevolent Street, great address, and they uh, try to mess with this resonator and see exactly what happened with these experiments. They push it too far. They all start getting uh, various levels of addicted to using this device and peeking behind the curtain, and then things go absolutely batshit, gross and goopy from there. Oh, man, I sure uh, do. Well, I just want to say that I, I love that, uh, again, wherever he comes in is basically saying, like, I've got some uh, some thoughts and some experiments, so I would like to take this murderer mm -hmm. uh, out of, you know, this uh, hospital for, for the mentally ill. I would like to take him to the scene of the crime. Uh, no just see what happens. Involved. Just, you know, we're just kind of yeah. mix it up. You kind of, you know, you go. And the woman says, that is absurd and unethical. Mm -hmm. And the next scene, there they are. Yeah. Uh, so it, it is indeed absurd. And there's a certain uh, suspension of disbelief that has to go on with this. And I think oh, yeah. the idea that, again, they just be like, go and take this murderer. You don't need him. Nobody's really paying. Like that itself, I think, is it, it's harder to believe yeah. than the idea that people would become these uh, you know, sort of monsters, these monstrous figures who are uh, – not quite even anymore uh, but it's not entirely sure what they are it's like they're evolving yeah. into something disgusting and wrong that's kind of the cool but also very powerful one of the cool decisions to like personify this monster is by basically making it dr pretorius like they killed this doctor and then they absorbed his form and there's some great makeup effects here where like they reach out to touch him he's got his great little like turtleneck crop top of body hair which is, is a uh, uh, really striking you reach out to touch him and he's got kind of like a stretch armstrong kind of uh, uh a texture to him like he's not fully done forming you know, and uh, he's just kind of using this human form, almost like a, a profane mockery of, of what they think of humanity. I don't know about you, but I'm thinking that summer 2023, what's remaining of it. Sorry, listeners, we record a bit in advance, so uh, it may there may be very little summer left when you hear this episode. But just know that summer of sunny uh, summer of 2023, I have dubbed summer of Pretorius, which means I'm going to walk around in an open black robe and nothing else. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> have that Pretorius girl summer. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, that Pretorius started off as a freak. You know, he started off as one of the creepiest uh, professors ever meet, the guy who's probably having weird sex with all of his students. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, he encounters this world and he evolves into some human comprehension. And yes. I'm amazed at, again, this was not a expensive movie to, to make. I think it cost three or four million dollars. Yeah. And they were able to make it for three or four million dollars because they made it in Europe. And I think if you made it in the United States, it would cost five times. Uh, as much as that, uh, sort of going back to his, his theater background, uh, one thing that kind of struck me about this is the uh, sets are very basic and the sets are yeah. very bare. Uh, they're just rooms and that's because they're saving all of the money for what's important. They're saving it for special effects. They're saving it for makeup. They're saving it for, you know. So yeah, they, my God, he, he over the course of his career, he made magic happen on a very yeah. high budget. And I think this might've been the most impressive case of making something that looks amazing and professional and groundbreaking. Uh, and, and really for very little money. By, by giving the movie this structure, we basically have a combination of haunted house movie and mad scientist movie. Like the lab that he has up in the attic 
it's basically just the same thing you would see in like an Ed Wood picture. You know, it's it's test the coils and it's it's uh, uh, lots of glowing consoles with big switches and stuff like that. You know, it's it's not entirely clear what everything does, but but you're right. Like the rest of the house is very bare except for kind of this sex dungeon that he's built for himself. You know, and again, it's it's meant to demonstrate that uh, Doctor Pretorius oh. <laughs> has. He's reaching beyond uh, the the limits of human pleasure, you know, and he's maximizing everything, human pleasure, human pain, all of that. And some of the funniest scenes in the movie, like I which I think are intentionally funny, are just shots of poor, repressed, terrified Jeffrey Combs sleeping on the spare bed in this sex dungeon surrounded by all this graphic imagery that he just can't really seem to grasp. Well, and one of the things that's kind of interesting and ambivalent is that all of this horror, all of this um, uh, monstrousness, uh, all of this terror, it makes the characters extremely horny. It does. <laughs> yes, it's, it's activating. Yeah. Uh, so a lot in this movie is made about the pineal gland or the pineal gland, whatever you, however you pronounce it. And it's uh, whatever this resonator is doing, it's making your pineal gland grow, which means you're experiencing everything at a 10. You know, so all of your fear, all of your pain, all of your horniness is all being triggered at the same time. And it's all being mashed up into this weird little mosaic. Of, yeah, of once once the resonator is going, all of these characters are edging. Yes, exactly, exactly. And they keep, you know, all of them except for Crawford seems to be the only one who's not really tempted by it. Uh, because I think he's, well, I mean, he's, he's tempted, but he also has seen firsthand what happens and and he's he's got a, a healthier fear of it than I think the other two in the house do. Uh, and uh, but Barbara Crampton's character in particular is really drawn and fascinated by this resonator and by by seeing beyond the veil the same way that Dr. Pretorius did. So there's an interesting idea. And that's that's going throughout uh, Gordon's work and throughout Lovecraft's work about the limits of science and about the responsibilities of science and things like that. Um, well, and I think part of what sort of uh, defines these characters in this world as much as being a bunch of perverts mm -hmm. uh, and being really freaky is that these people are incredibly intelligent. Mm -hmm. And they're not just smart, they're so smart that they have uh, dangerous knowledge and they have forbidden knowledge and they have uh, the intellect and the brilliance to <laughs> wants to explore this dimension that again if you were just a schmuck you would not want to do that but again there's this idea that they're kind of these uh, creatures of pure intellect and because of that they don't realize and because they don't have the emotion to be like we shouldn't go to these places these places are dark these places are horrible these places will destroy us they're just so curious and it's kind of you know the the curiosity that brought down adam and eve yeah uh, this idea of we want to know everything and experience everything and not realizing that you know you are um yeah risking your life and the lives of the people around you by yeah, and they're professional academics too where the whole game yeah. is just like be more novel be on the cutting edge like get there before yeah. your peers you know no risk no reward all of that so they're they're being motivated that you know it's like you my intellect and strength are power yeah there's there's an interesting uh like i i feel like combs's character is very sexually repressed and it's something that he is actively fighting you know throughout the entire thing he mentions that like he used to have to just like sit in his guest room while he listened to pretorius having sex with all of his students or whatever and like and he just he just sits there and he listens and he's like he doesn't know how to react to it you know and i think that's one of the things that makes him most afraid of experimenting with that resonator is what is that going to unlock in him like this thing that he's very carefully caged in his persona you know and it, it's it's just uh, another part of the great uh uh, twitchy charm that <laughs> performance. Well, I think you know one of the things that kind of defines him here is that he's very damaged. You know, yeah, a trauma he's taking, seen and experiencing things that nobody should see or experience. You know, he thinks that just when you think that things can't possibly get any more apocalyptic or more filled with dread, it kind of you know goes to another extreme without you know sort of lurching into you know uh, self parody or camp or any of those things. I think Gordon walks a very fine line here of extreme terror mm. uh, without getting into, and, and like you said, there's dark comedy here, but it's intentional dark comedy. 
this, like the Cronenberg dark comedy. It's, you know, we realize how weird and gross and disgusting this is, um, and we embrace it. Yes, know, I want to like, talk about that weird, gross, disgustingness um, in the form of some praise for John Carl Beekler mm. and his uh, effects in this movie. And I feel like if I had a time machine, I would go back to sometime in the mid 80s and I would make Rob Boutin and John Carl <laughs> Beekler team up for the body horror epic, The Thing from Beyond. Oh, and just yeah. Let those two guys go nuts because there is such a textile um disgusting um what's the word i'm looking for here um everything is slick surface Mm. everything is dripping and goopy and wet and this movie is very very wet there's a layer of sheen on everything uh, it kind of makes I you want to take a shower. Yeah. Like, yeah. This, is a, this is a movie that makes you feel a little a little grimy in, in kind of all the best ways. And I mean, yeah, these these effects are so great in the way that they just kind of ramp up. Even when you see the seams in it, like, you know, you can look at it in a 2023 lens and say, oh, yeah, I know exactly how they pulled that off. But it's just that they made it in the first place. You know, I, I think this movie is an interesting precursor to a film that the producer Brian Yuzna would make a couple years after this called society, which basically this, this concept like maxed out to a 10 and like made as weird and as gross. as We we only pre shunt in this movie. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. They're not full shunting. Yeah. Well, and it's setting it back to the, the uh, striking uh, video box art that, yeah, uh, yeah, one of the most striking images of this is, you know, the cover box for the video and is Pretorius in one of his final states. And there's his face, his hideous, dark, you know, disturbing face. And then there's just this wall of flesh, you know, yeah. it's all like square and it's so disturbing and so creepy. Uh, and, and again, I think if you were to make this in 2023 and do a CGI, it would be soulless and it would be yeah. scary and it would just be this empty experience. And a large part of what makes this so unforgettable and so good is that it uses practical effects. Yes. And it uses, you know, these craftsmen and these artists who've, you know, worked their entire lives to create something. And Absolutely. And disgust the holy living crap out of you with the most, you know, repulsive things you've ever seen. So I think that's part of what makes this, uh, and, you know, the reanimator, uh, such classics is that they, and they obviously took a lot of pride in what they yes. did, and they should have done because they did a great job making some of the grossest stuff uh, in all of 1980s horror. Absolutely. And I mean, yeah, there there really is a lot to be said about it. And if if you look at like the DVD art that came out, I think in like 2006 or something like that. So lame. It it makes it look like an alien autopsy movie or something like that. It's completely incongruous with what we actually see in the movie. I feel like that was common. I feel like there was a lot of really outrageous 80s VHS and poster art that was then... Re- not replicated but replaced i guess w- is a better word for it with really sterile like it was like in the 90s and early 2000s we did not want the neon grandiose brightness of v like because this movie is all about lighting and yeah. you would not know that based on if you looked at a DVD cover art that came out in 2002, where everything is muted and brown and gray. Whereas like this movie is, I, I mean, I guess I, I like to call it San Junipero lighting, but I think sure. r- really it, a lot of people refer to it as bisexual lighting. And yeah. there's a lot of purples and well, let's just say there, there's 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 a lot of pink in this movie, and it's yeah. a very different pink than uh, will be showcased in the the Barbie movie. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit more disturbing. And again, I think that kind of you know gets to you know sort of the color out of space. This idea yeah. that you know there are sounds and there are lights and there are all these different things, and you know sort of Gordon's ability to realize this through sound design, through special effects, through lighting. Uh, so I think he is our our as our preeminent interpreter of H.P. Lovecraft because he just got the guy and he was able to you know sort of take what was good about him and interesting and worthwhile. Uh, and get rid of you know some of the racism, the, some yeah, of the, the, the eugenics, some of the some of the the, the nasty stuff. 
Uh, it, is, it is interesting to see how like each one of the Gordon uh, Lovecraft movies kind of has its own color coding. Like the reanimator is very green from beyond's very purple. Castle Freak's got very orange and like kind of earthy tones to it. Uh, so he, he's always got a, like a strong visual style. And there is something about this kind of pink purple, like you mentioned color out of space. Like they use that same tone in the Nicolas Cage movie. And I think that's intentional. There is something about this that doesn't feel entirely natural, you know, like it's not, it's a color we recognize, but it just, it's one that you can use in a context to create like a surreality that I think really works here. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the last act of the movie is uh, basically Crawford undergoing a really horrific transformation where his pineal gland it grows so large that it needs to burst through the front of his forehead oh, my in goodness. a in a design that can only be described as both male and female genitalia in one um that this little probing stalk that'll come out of his head that forces him to eat brains and suck the eyes out of people's heads <laughs> uh as it, it it's it leads to this confrontation where he has to summon the last little scrap of his humanity that he has to sacrifice himself, stop Pretorius, and uh, save Crampton's character. Uh, although, really, I think the the ending tells us that she's not really been saved by anything at all, and that she is uh, in much worse shape than she would have been, uh, regardless. But it, it's some pretty incredible stuff in this showdown, especially like the the image of Combs getting his head twisted off. We see that early on, like the first shot of the movie is that we see that happen to Pretorius. We get kind of a glimpse of like he's his head's been kind of garbage bagged, you know, it's like just been twisted around so nothing will leak out. And then we get to see what that process looks like uh, in the head of this weird kind of space bug. And uh, it's horrific and amazing. One of our one of our favorite things about doing this show is that every movie is going to be like sub 90 minutes. Yeah, yeah it's, it's I don't think we're going to hit a single like two hour movie. Well, I'm writing a, a book about uh, movies about movies. It's a mm. really interesting experience. I think I'm 327 movies in. Uh, and one thing that's fascinating to me is they made a lot of movies about movies in the 30s and 1931, 1932, 1933. And part because they're like, hey, we've got this crazy new thing called uh, sound. We should make movies about it. <laughs> and it's very common for a movie to be 60. Two minutes long, or yeah. 65 minutes. And all the last 63 minutes. I'm like, why did we get away from that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, why do we have this idea that, you know, no matter how crappy you are, you need to be at least 90 minutes? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. What I what I wouldn't give for a 90 minute studio movie now. <laughs> I know for real. Like I, you know, I, I was I had high hopes for the new Indiana Jones. I'm like, all right, these are usually pretty tight, and this one's like two and a half hours long. Oh, yeah. It's like, oh my I, god, dude. dude. Yeah, That's exactly. a little bit excessive. A little bloated, a little bloated. And this this one is very not bloated. This is very lean, very mean, very efficient. Uh, it, it gets in, it fucks with your head, and then it gets out. You know, I, I watched this with my girlfriend for the first time, and she's like, you know, kind of watching awestruck the entire movie. And then the moment credits roll, she's like, that was a fucking wild ride. Like, <laughs> it's, it's a really hard movie to describe, and it's a really hard movie to kind of prepare people for. Because, yeah, it is really gross, but it's also really funny and like darkly sexy and darkly in, like satirical and like it, it's kind of got a lot going on uh under the guise of like this gross out monster movie oh yeah well that was uh Stuart Gordon you know there's always something going on uh under the surface as well as on the surface uh and yeah he created this uh, amazing world and uh, he didn't make that many movies but good lord uh they're all uh at the exception of Dolls, which I'm a little uh, underwhelmed by, uh, yeah, they're same. all at least good. They're all at least watchable, you know? Yeah. And some of them are very, very good. Some of them are masterpieces like this. And some of them, you know, you wouldn't expect. I mean, he made a kid's film uh, called The Wonderful Ice Cream Soup. That's wonderful. It just is really yeah. charming, really funny Hispanic movie about kids. Uh, not kids. <laughs> For kids. Yeah. It's very family friendly. And That's he, a I mean, he, he wrote the he wrote the original screenplay that Honey I Shrunk the Kids was based on. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, well, uh, he was still like an executive producer on the TV show version of that. Yeah, directed an like, episode. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so That's crazy. Based on characters by Stuart Gordon. Uh, yeah, we we not. We didn't mention in our last episode, but we we lost Stuart Gordon fairly recently. We lost him during COVID, um, and uh, I don't think he died of COVID, but it was during that era. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah so just a few years ago. Um, but no, he he was definitely one of the greats, and I'm really excited to continue to get to dig into 
his catalog here. There are there are still one or two that I have not seen, um, and some of them we're going to get to in the course of the show, which is great. So yeah. I want to make a statement about this movie and then turn it into a oh, question wow. for you, Nathan. Yes. So um, I want to really quickly throw a little shout out to a friend of the show, Dylan James Quarles, and another podcast that he does called Barstool Cinema uh, School. And what they do is they talk about whether or not they think a movie is a good bar movie. And by mm. those metrics, what they mean is if you see this movie with no sound and a crappy <laughs> TV in a bar, are you going to be turning your attention to it and mouthing the dialogue and and following what's going on? And I think that this movie is a great bar movie because I and we used to do this. Um, this was one along with Suspiria and some other Giallo and movies that had really striking imagery as movies we would, my friends and I would throw on in the background of parties. Mm. So it would be, if there were people there who had never seen it, they weren't hearing anything. They were just seeing these images and without fail, someone would be like, what are you watching? What is this movie? And so it would always get people's attention and they would be entranced by what they were seeing, even though they didn't narratively know what was going on. And so I, I feel like this movie with all of the, amazing John Carl Beekler effects and the amazing Lovecraft light, uh, lighting and all of these other aspects. It's such a fun no, bar movie. Not. So let me, let me ask you, Nathan, do you remember the first time you saw this movie? Because I saw this movie probably <laughs> not, not in the eighties, maybe in the nineties, mid nineties. But then by the time I was in my early twenties and we started to have house parties and things like that, it became a favorite of mine and my friend group, but it was, it took a longer time for me to warm up to the Stuart Gordon Lovecraft stuff more so than, you know, your standard slasher franchises. But uh, do you remember when you saw this for the first time? Yeah, because uh, it was fairly recently. Uh, I oh, didn't do this until I had to do it for the uh, Gordon retrospective that I'm doing over at my website. And I'm like, holy crap, this is a master. This is better than the reanimator. This is maybe the best film that he's ever done. Uh, so I was completely blown away by it. And I was just as impressed by it uh, when I saw it yesterday. So yeah. it, it, to say that it really holds up would be an understatement. Also, it's only been about eight months <laughs> since I saw it for the first time. Uh, so be I would have bet every dollar I have in the bank that your store, your relationship with this movie would have predated mine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very surprised yeah. to hear and that. I, that's like, not I've definitely the case. been fascinated by the, uh, by the cover. And that's when I say about, you know, it's kind of forced me to see all these weird movies and be like, wow, these are all really, really cool. And I actually just got sad thinking about that. He didn't make a movie for the last 13 years of his life. Yeah. Uh, and his last couple of movies are really, really good. I mean, the, he did yeah. a that adaptation. That's unbelievably dark and really compelling. And then stuff which is this really really neat sort of neo-noir based on a true story about a, a nurse who uh runs over a, home, a homeless man played by um stephen ray uh and he doesn't go out it's just like stuck in the windshield for over a day and it's just a really really compelling dark comedy with a lot of social commentary and yeah i cannot recommend the movie stuck uh enough he definitely went on a high note but good lord you had the option to give Stuart gordon money to make movies and you didn't oh, very disappointed in you didn't did a couple of million dollars oh, it, it it did always feel like hollywood it did always feel like he was a guy who could have crossed over if he wanted to you know yeah, and yeah, yeah. uh uh, you know, I appreciate that he stuck to his B movie sensibilities. So it looks like we have to let you go. But um, <laughs> uh, thank you so so much for 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 coming on talking. Well, where can people find all of your stuff? I know you've got so much stuff uh, all over the place, uh, out there. Yeah, you can find me. I've got a podcast called Travolta Cage, where me and my co-host watch all of uh, Nicholas Cage's movies and John Travolta's movies to determine which actor is better. It's Nicholas Cage, obviously. No, uh, yeah. I have my website, Nathan Raven's Happy Place. That's NathanRaven.com. I have a Substack called Nathan Raven's Bad Ideas, where I'm doing a bunch of crazy stuff, like uh, watching all of uh, James Belushi's movies. <laughs> I just watched The Man with One Red Shoe, uh, and then oh, I got God. books. Oh yeah, I'm let me uh, let me know when uh, Traces of Red is coming out. Will do, <laughs> will do. Oh, definitely. I got a whole bunch of weird ones uh, to look forward to, uh, and then yeah, I've got a your books uh the most recent one is the joy of trash extended garbage fire extended edition and i'm working on a, a book now called the fractured mirror that will be mm. about, movies about movies and right now it's over 530 pages long uh, yeah. and i'm only about 90 percent done with it so it will be a very i think i have a kind of like a leonard malton 
sort of film guide, except uh, only about one kind of movie. So I love that idea. That, that's that's amazing. Amazing. We waxed nostalgic uh, on another show Steve and I were doing where we were talking about those Leonard Malton guides and how oh, yeah. for, for me, that was an every year Christmas stocking stuffer, but it was a dead giveaway because it would just weigh the stocking down to where it was almost <laughs> falling down. But it was every year a publication from the early night from probably 1990 or so till whenever they went out of publication i feel like i would get them and i know and steve was talking about them too and we just i sort of love the idea of a specialized version of that just about one and i'm going to go out on a limb and say it's a type of movie that we're probably interested in and our listeners are probably interested yeah. in as well. <laughs> absolutely absolutely well uh, thank you so much again for being here I've, I've been such a fan of yours for so long it's it's been really exciting to to have you on uh, it was a lot of fun yeah, thank you so much, Nathan. Uh, so you can find all of our stuff at, at uh, Puppet Masters Castle Freaks uh, Instagram. We're on Threads now under that same thing. Uh, you can email us at puppetmasterscastlefreaks at gmail dot com. Uh, and be sure to tune in next week because next week we are going to be talking about one of the one of the rare comedies, like one of the rare straight comedies that we're covering on this show, and it's called Cannibal Women in the Avocado Jungle of Death. Wait, uh, that's our Bill Maher. Yes, it sure does. And I've, uh, I, I, that remains a sticking point uh, on that movie for me. But uh, we'll we'll get into all of that. Um, Pizza Man himself. Bill the, the Pizza Man. <laughs> yes, absolutely. New no-nos. All right. Uh, all right, everybody. Well, we will uh, see you next time. And thank you again. <laughs>